something like that, huh? <laughs> well, this is very exciting. Uh, this is not a normal day for me. Um, on the long summer days, I get up at 3.15 to get ready to go out in the park. We can start to look for the wolves about 5 a.m. We're going to be talking about a wolf that lives in and he was known as Wolf 21. So to tell his story, we'll go back to the days before the reintroduction. I was Wolf Interpreter. I had worked in Denali National Park for 15 summers before Yellowstone, so I had been around wolves there a lot in the past. So my first summer before the reintroduction, I would be doing talks like to you folks and explaining that wolves were a nail them all off as of 1926 and the reintroduction plan was to make up for that mistake. So many of you know the, the basic story. The first year they caught 14 wolves in Alberta, three packs, and brought them down. We're going to emphasize the story of one of those packs, the Rose Creek pack. So it was a mother wolf, number nine, her yearling daughter, number seven. Her mate had been killed by trappers in Alberta. So they had an extra adult male wolf, number 10. They put him in the same acclimation pen, which is about the size of this room, as the mother and daughter. And fortunately, the two adults got along very well. So well that by the time they were released two months later, she was pregnant. Now the complication in that story, they explored where they were released. They wanted to apparently see if there was any place better. So they walked further east and unknowingly to them, they passed over the eastern border of the National Park. So that was a problematic situation. And then a bad guy saw the father wolf, number 10, and shot and killed him. So that meant that um, we had a very pregnant female. Her daughter, by the way, had left her by that time to start her own family. So a single mother with eight pups on the way. She had her litter and she was in a desperate situation. A mother wolf in the wild needs a lot of help. That's why wolves live in a pack, in a family. Normally, the park service does not intervene in a wildlife situation, but this was a critical moment for the reintroduction. With her having eight pups, her one family represented a, a huge portion of all the wolves in the region. So they found her den, they caught her, they caught all of her pups, they brought them back to the acclimation pen where she had gotten pregnant with a plan to release them six months later. We fed them twice a week with a roadkill elk or a bison, something like that. So it would be almost impossible for her as a single mother to protect and feed a family that large. And then something very close to a miracle happened. And it was with the, the least likeliest of all the wolves in Yellowstone. And that was little number eight. He was the runt of his litter. He belonged to the Crystal Creek wolf pack. He had three brothers. When he was little, he was picked on and bullied and beat up all the time. He looked different from everyone else in his family. He had a dull gray coat. His father and his brothers all had these glossy gray coats. His mother was whitish. And so he had a really difficult time growing up. He was a yearling at this point in his life, and he had discovered that his life was a bit better if he was a lone wolf. And that led to the most important moment of his life, 
and one of the critical moments in the whole history of wolves in Yellowstone. We think what happened was on his own, he had heard some howling up this one drainage. So he walked up there, and there was probably this moment where he came around the turn in the creek, and he saw something in the meadow ahead of him, which he had never seen in his life. As far as he knew, this thing that he saw didn't even exist, because every day of his life, every single day, he was always the smallest wolf. And what he was seeing were some of number nine's pups. They were actually smaller than he was. So instantly, a sense of empathy arose in him. He ran over to the pups, made friends with them, played with them. And whether he knew it or not, he was being watched by their mother. She was desperate for help. Um, he was not the, um, perhaps the, the greatest candidate in the world for her to pair off with and to be her alpha male, but he was there and he was available. And he had already made friends with her pups. So he was in as a yearling, the equivalent of maybe a 15-year-old boy, a 16-year-old boy. Now he was a big shot alpha male. <laughs> and he proved himself. So he adopted and raised those eight pups, did a tremendous job on that. And then the following spring, he became a biological father himself, fathered three pups. And that's where our main character comes into play. So one of those eight pups that he adopted was destined to become our greatest wolf, maybe the greatest wolf that ever lived. Wolf 21. 21 had genetics from his biological father that he was destined to grow up into this huge, super strong, super competent male wolf. So the story of a wolf like that that had that destiny, those genetics, to have him raised by this little runt of his litter, number eight, was just a fascinating story. I do a lot of talks for kids and I say it, it's not too much different from the story of Superman, how he lost his father when he was young and he was just raised by an average farmer in, Tex, in, excuse me, in Kansas. So that was their relationship, father and son. And 21 was always devoted to his adopted father. Um, they formed a team, they went out hunting together, they did everything together. Um, and he just had a tremendous amount of respect for the wolf that really saved his family. And w the first thing that I noticed about 21 when I began to study him as a yearling was his sense of empathy. And some of you have heard this story because I've told it and written about it many times. When he was helping his parents raised a new litter of pups. One of them was sick. We never really figured out what was wrong with that pup. Because he was sick and he behaved differently from his litter mates, the other pups didn't play with him. So he was always off to the side, the other pups were playing around. So it really kind of tugged at your heart to see what a bad time this little guy was having. So this one day I watched 21 come back with a, from a hunt. He, he brought food to his mother. He fed the other pups. He played with them. And then he just stopped and he started to look around. And I realized he was looking for the sick pup. He saw it off in the distance and just trotted over there and hung out with that little guy. So it was really just this heartwarming thing. It was kind of like seeing an NFL player um, grant the wish of a, of a sick kid and visiting him in the hospital. Now, right after that, 21 reached the point in his life where it was time for him to set out on his own and make his way through life. So he did something that to us was a big mistake. He left the safety of his territory and went into the neighboring pack territory of the Druid Wolves. 
And that was a very violent, very aggressive part, pack, but he just strolled into it. He didn't know, but their alpha male and the beta male had both been illegally shot and killed outside the park, just like 21's own father had been. So when he entered Lamar Valley, the adult females in that family, they were desperate to find a replacement for their alpha male. And when 21 showed up, they were very happy to see him. So there were five pups. They were kind of the icebreakers. They ran over and greeted him. It was almost a repeat of the scene where age showed up and the pups wanted to meet him. And then all the adult females came over. Now, those of you that know a little bit about the Yellowstone Wolves, you may remember the story of Alpha Female 40 in the Jewett Peak Pack. Uh, she had a very violent, very aggressive personality, uh, like something out of Shakespeare or Game of Thrones. And uh, she had already driven her own mother out of the family and one of her sisters. She had one remaining sister, 42, and they were different as night and day. There was a bad sister and a good sister. How many of you women have a bad sister? Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> or how many of you were the bad sisters? Uh, so, uh, okay, you were the bad sister, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 21 ended up in the middle of something that he didn't know what he was getting into. And we could see from day one that there was something going on between him and Wolf 42. They were perfectly matched. They have the same type of personalities and character. And you could see that 21 was kind of on to 40. But male wolves have a great deal of respect for females. Uh, many of you know that wolves live in a matriarchal society. And so 21 had this uh, aspect of his life that he was unable to do anything that would harm or go against a female wolf. He got that from his relationship with his mother. And so it was a very difficult situation for him because he was drawn to 42, but yet 40 was the boss. So he was in the middle of all this female drama. Is there any guy here that's ever been in a situation <laughs> like that? Okay, good. Um, and um, 40 did <laughs> the worst possible thing a sister can do to her sister. For two years in a row, she did the unimaginable. She killed 42's pups. Um, which was a, a horrible thing for 21 because he was the father of those pups. But he still had no clue how to deal with 40. He was really helpless. So he had to rely on 42 to deal with a bad sister. And it all came to a head in the spring of 2000. One of the most dramatic things that probably has ever been witnessed in a wolf pack. So I went out early this one particular morning to try to monitor what was gonna happen between the two sisters. 42 had the intelligence to pick a den site that was five miles away from her sisters, hoping that that would be far enough. By that time, she had built up an alliance with some of the younger females in the family. So she had kind of her own gang going on. And we saw 40 leaving her den, walking the five miles to 42's den, which was up in the trees, we saw 40 march up to that section. We could just barely through the trees, saw her meet up with 42. And by that time, it was about to get dark. It was the end of the day. And we were just 
terrified at what she had in mind for her sister. Was this going to be the third year in a row that she killed all of her sister's pups? We just wouldn't put it past her. It got dark. We couldn't see anything. I came out early the next morning. Both sisters had collars, so I used my telemetry equipment. I got really loud signals from both, both sisters. As I was doing that, a woman ran over to me that was nearly hysterical. And she grabbed me and she pointed off on the side of the road. I looked there and there was a wolf lying in the ditch just drenched with blood. We went over and I, the worst had happened. That um, it was 42 and it just looked like there was no way that she could survive all of her injuries. However, I then looked at her a little bit closer and it wasn't 42. When I saw that um, the blood had obscured the true color of her coat, it wasn't 42, but it was 40. And she died within the hour of blood loss and shock. When we examined her, the critical thing that explained what had happened was this. Her entire body was riddled with wolf bites, meaning way more than just one wolf could have inflicted on her. So we think it happened like this. 40 went up to the den. She probably went to grab one of 42's pups. 42 just could not tolerate that any longer. So for the first time in her life, she stood up to her sister. But she didn't have that violent streak that 40 had. So I'm sure that for the initial part of the fight, she was losing. But she had those allies, her female friends. And so they jumped in on the side of the wolf that had befriended them, and the three of them in combination defeated 40. And then the next stage of that story was even more heart-wrenching because 21 was desperate. He was back with the pups at 40's den. They were crying out to be nursed, to be fed, and there was nothing he could do about that. So we saw him walk the five miles to 42. He got her, he brought her back to 40's den to show her the pups in hopes that she would show them mercy. But if you were 42, what would you do to your sister's pups after all the way that she had treated you over the years? The sister that had killed your pups two years in a row. But that den was in a thick forest. We could not see what was happening. After an hour, 42 came out of the trees. She went to her den, and one by one over the next day in her mouth, she carried her pups to the main den. There were two other mothers that year. She got them to bring their pups to the central location, so she totally reorganized the family. We spent our days uh, up on a hill watching the den forest in hopes that we would be able to eventually get a count of pups. And finally, after a month or so, maybe six weeks, we saw through an opening in the tree, 42 coming out along with one of the other mothers, that we saw a pup following them. We saw another pup. After a few minutes, our count of pups was 21. And so that was the proof, the evidence, that she was raising her sister's pups and helping the other two mother wolves with their pups. At the end of the year, <laughs> at the end of the year, 20 of the 21 pups had survived, which is just an unbelievably success story. Whereas during 40's reign, she came nowhere near to that success level. And that was all because of the organizing ability that 42 had. So she was just a genius at getting everyone to work together. 
Now, getting back to 21's story, um, as far as he was concerned, um, he had the easy part. All he had to do was to protect the family from rival packs. He was the undisputed, undefeated heavyweight champion of Yellowstone, so that was easy for him to do. Um, and then for hunting, he was a master hunter, so that was also an easy thing for him to go out on a hunt, kill an elk, and then bring back food to, to, to give to the pups. He liked playing with the pups at all, so he was the ideal father. And one of my favorite stories of 21 was the pups loved their father so much that they just wouldn't leave him alone. So he would come back from a hunt, he'd be exhausted, he would feed them. He just wanted to take his afternoon nap and the pups would just pester him and pester him. And he would tolerate that for a long time. He had a lot of toleration. But then one day he just couldn't take it any longer. So he literally ran away from the pups. He ran across the park road. He found um, some really thick willow bushes he hid in there, and that's where he took his afternoon nap. So he knew how to deal with that. Um, the 21 had with 42 was like nothing I had ever seen before. They were just perfectly matched with each other. And the years went by, and kind of like a married couple that had been together for decades, the older the husband and wife got, the more they looked like each other. And that's exactly what happened with 21 and 42. They were born jet black. This won't happen to anyone here, but the older they got, guess what? The grayer they got at about the same pace. And they had this idyllic life. Everything was perfect for them. And then something came along to kind of spoiled that perfect family um, tableau in Lamar Valley. And that was Wolf 302. And some of you know a little bit about 302. He was 21's nephew. And if 21 is at this level of male responsibility, 302 was at the other end. So 302, probably you could say, was the best looking male wolf we've ever had in the history of Yellowstone. You knew him, right? Uh -huh. uh, he was just drop dead gorgeous. And he got a lot of 21's daughters pregnant and then abandoned them. So 21 was the opposite of 302 in that 21 would be willing to fight to the death to protect his family. With 302, he was with two of 21's pregnant daughters, and twice in the same day, a rival pack charged at his little group, and 302 just ran off to save himself after wishing them good luck. Uh, so he was afraid uh, of doing anything that might harm him, that might mess up his appearance. Now, 21 knew 302 for what he really was, and I don't know if there's any fathers in the audience that have ever had a situation with a daughter where you didn't approve of their boyfriends, but boy, 21 really knew what 302's character was like. So he would catch 302 and he would beat him up, but he just could not kill the boyfriend. He just had that reservation and 302 could take advantage of that so in the end, when 302 abandoned 21's daughters, 21 had to raise 302's pups. So that year when we later collared some of those young wolves and did DNA testing, five of them had been sired by 302, but raised by 21. So several years went by, the relationship between 21 and 302 kind of continued. And um, I'll have to go back to 21 story to finish our talk today, but if you'd like to learn what happened to 302 and why at the very, very end of his very long life, he turned things around 
and against all expectations, became a wolf very much like his uncle, 21. So the role modeling that 21 had accidentally played out for 302 eventually sunk in. It was kind of a story like the prodigal son. So in the end, he became one of our greatest heroes against all expectations. But let's go back to 21's story. So he and 42 grew old together. They eventually were approaching their ninth birthdays. The average lifespan in Yellowstone for our wild wolves is only about five years. So they're approaching twice the average length of Yellowstone wolves. And females, female wolves do not have the equivalent of menopause. So 42 just kept on having pups year after year after year. Does that sound like a good plan? Uh -huh. So she was the equivalent of probably in her 60s and still raising pups every year. So that brings us to the mating season of 2004. They were nearly nine years old, probably maybe the equivalent of a married couple in their early 70s. They had both turned gray by that time. And one of my favorite memories is I got to see the two of them mate that year. And it was a very, very touchy thing, a very touching thing, because if you've never seen wolves mate, it's a lengthy process that can go on for 10, 20, 30 minutes. And very emotional, very touching. And there was a moment where they lied down together and he stretched out his front right paw and just put it over her shoulder, kind of in an embrace. And um, that's the strongest memory that I have of them. It was the end of the day, it was getting dark. I folded up all my equipment, I drove home, and um, I came out the next day. And during that night, everything had changed in the pack. When I got out the next morning, I found the Druid Wolves, I found 21, but not 42. She wasn't there. It's a long story, but I have to condense it. We found out later what had happened was a rival pack during the middle of the night had attacked the Druid Wolves. We think what had happened was 21 in his role as the protector of the family was fighting with a whole bunch of the other wolves. While that was happening over here, 42 was also fighting to protect the pups. And we think that several of the rival wolves ganged up on her. We had reason to believe that she ran off she swam through a river as she was being chased. She got up on a high ridge. They cor cornered her there. She fought as well as she could, but she was a very old wolf. She was outnumbered. They bit her, they attacked her, and she died from her injuries. But that was about five miles away from where 21 was. So when I arrived the next morning, I found him, I found all the other Druid adults, I found all the pups, everyone but 42. We knew, of, we realized what had happened to her, but he never knew. So when I wrote my book on 21, I went back through all my daily records and saw something that I didn't really pick up on at the time. Over the next few months, it was like he was in a search pattern. So those of you that have not been to Yellowstone, the Druid territory goes through the Lamar Valley and part of the Yellowstone River Valley. Those valleys run very roughly east to west. And so I saw during those days over the next couple of months, he would 
lead the pack on a trek on the mountains on the north side of the valley and then cross the valley and lead them on a trek back and forth on the mountains on the south side of the valley. They ju he just went back and forth like he was searching for something or someone. And we knew that she had died on this far western section of the southern ridge, and he went almost that far, but never quite that far. There were, I think, two times where he turned around within about a mile of that site. So to the very end, it looked like he was still hopeful that he would find her. He didn't know the truth of what had happened. And during those days, he was getting grayer and grayer and grayer. And then in early June, I went out as usual one early morning. He was with his family. Everything seemed normal. Um, he seemed to be doing okay. He was maybe a little bit more lethargic than usual. Um, he had just passed his ninth birthday. By that time, he was three times older than the next oldest wolf in his family. So um, even in his own family, it seemed like he just, he wasn't fitting in like he was when he was a little bit younger. That evening, I was still out and some of his adult daughters saw an elk. They chased the elk. They needed help. They looked back toward their father. 21 would never miss a hunt. That's what he lived for, to chase elk and feed his family. I looked at him and he lifted his head and he saw what was happening and he didn't get up. It was like he just did not have the energy anymore. And I knew that this was the end for him. I came out the next morning and he was gone. I could see every other member of his family. Everyone else was accounted for everyone but him. Now, 21 had a radio caller, but by that time, his battery had died. And so I thought about it. And I came to a conclusion that maybe it's best if the greatest wolf that we ever had just kind of quietly faded away. And it's best if maybe we just never knew exactly where we ended up. I thought that would be an appropriate way for his story to end. But it ended a little bit differently. A month later, we got a report from an outfitter. He was way up high in the mountains, and he found something. He brought something back from the site from where he had found that item. It was a radio collar. It was 21's radio collar. We knew that meadow. We called it the Opal Creek Rendezvous site. Years earlier, I'd gone on a long hike, and at a distance, I had seen 21 and 42 and their whole family in that meadow. 21 and 42 were side by side, and it'd be like seeing the grandparents at their cabin at the lake, maybe sitting on a porch, watching their adult children and their grandchildren playing down by the lake shore. It was a happy place for them. And that's where he wanted to go. So it looked like he decided to spend the last of the little bit of energy and strength he had in his body by going from the bottom of Lamar Valley all the way up to the top of the mountains to that exact rendezvous site. We rode horses up there. We got to the site. We were told where to look. We were told that there's a little hill, there was one tree on that hill, and he was found in the shade of that hill. He was still there when we arrived. He seemed very peaceful. It seemed that he died perhaps in a, at a happy moment. That's where he wanted to be. And as I thought about it later, I realized that the tree growing on that hill 
pretty much absolutely for sure as he was going up that hill would have, like any wolf or perhaps any dog, would have stopped and sniffed at that tree. It would have absolutely been a tree that both he and 42 would have sent marked maybe 20, 30, maybe a couple hundred times during the trips that they had made up there. So what helped me to deal with the loss of 21, with uh, all the emotion of that, is the thought that when he stopped at that tree and sniffed at it, his sense of smell would have been so acute, thousands of times better than ours, he would have been able to get her scent on that tree. And for him to get that scent and then lay down on that hill where he probably only had a few more hours of life. I think the way that it works with wolves is when they get a scent like that, a image in their mind appears of the wolf that let that scent. So as he was drifting off, I think the very last image that he had in his mind was an image that was triggered by that scent, meaning when he passed away, he was thinking of Will 42. And that was a thought that really comforted me. I remember the first time I told my theory about 21's death, it was with a woman friend of mine. And I just wanted to see, well, what would her response be to that part of the story? So I told her that, and I just waited for her to say, well, yeah, that makes sense, or, you know, I don't know. But she didn't say anything because she was sobbing. And you may know that men can't handle it when women cry in front of them. So I thought I had said something to offend her. And I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she blurted out, by saying this, she said, why can't I find a man like 21? <laughs> so that's the thought I'll leave with you. What a guy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We finished it. Um, we're not absolutely sure of the title, but it would probably be something like this, Alpha Female. Wolf 06, and other great Yellowstone matriarchs. We're going to fit you into it, too. Okay? <laughs> and so 06, many of you know the 06 female. She was 21's granddaughter. And um, boy, she was our greatest female. And she was a, a worthy descendant of uh, her grandfather. Um, and Jane Goodell has already written the introduction to that book. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Thank you, Rick. So what I'm going to do is, if anybody has a question for Rick, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone so he can hear you. Anybody have any questions? Can you yell? You're, you're way out there. Can you yell it? No, it was working. It, it was working, yes. Uh -huh. So did you find her Yes, we can talk about that. That's a good question. Thank you for asking it. So she, um, let's say the park road was here. She died on a little bit of the back side of Specimen Ridge, which cut out the, the signal. So where I was, where I could see 21 in the other Druid walls, I could get their signals, but I was blocked by Specimen Ridge. So I drove down the road uh, trying for her signal. I finally got it, and um, it was a very emotional moment for me. I was happy to get the signal, but I'm not sure if I said it, the beats per, uh, per minute double. And so I was desperate to not hear that, that fast beat, but that's exactly what I got. And then a Wolf Project crew went out to verify that it was her and she was dead. And they told me that she put up a valiant fight by herself. Um, so she was a great heroine at the very end, but that was the end for her. Was she on like the south side? Yes. Of the 
Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, you, you have that right. Yes. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yeah, she asked if she was maybe trying to get her away from her pups. That, that's, that's a real intriguing question. I didn't really think of that. Um, she actually did something that was really smart. She ran toward the Lamar River, meaning, you know, kind of like if you're being chased by bloodhounds or something like that, if you go through water. So she got to the other side, and then just by bad luck, when they came out on the other side, they were able to get her signal. And... The, the story of the multi-generation feud between the Druid genetic line and the Mollish genetic line is also like something out of a Shakespeare, but it goes back to her sister, Forty, where Forty attacked the ancestors of the Molly's wolves and killed their alpha male and took their territory from them. So generation after generations, there were rematches between the, the two genetic lines, but it had been started by 40. Now, 40 was long dead by this time, but the vengeance of the wolves was visited on the good sister rather than the bad sister. And then, Another descendant of the Druid wolves was the 06 female, and she also had to cope with uh, the Molly's wolves, and she had the genetics from 21 and all those other great wolves, and she was the one that ultimately defeated them and really showed them who was the boss. So that's one of the reasons we love the 06 female so much. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I don't know that I added up the hours, but um, let's see, I'm getting close to being out in the field for 9,000 days. So if you want to do some math on that, <laughs> I don't know if I'm at that advanced in calculations. I'm hoping to get to day 10,000. So that's coming up and I think about another four years if I can keep on doing this. So, so far I can. Mm -hmm. I hope you can. Yeah, it's, I don't want to miss anything. So that's my motivation. So it would kill me to not go out. Yeah, I would crawl out if I had to. Yeah. Yeah, a lady over here. I couldn't quite hear all, but when we. Okay. Uh, so for, for some of you, if, when we find um, um, a deceased wolf, what do we do? That's a very good question. We, um, in a way, maybe I, I would I will say we would prefer not to have to do it, but we feel that we do need to take the skull for our collection because otherwise someone else would take it and it might end up in a situation that wouldn't be respectful of the animal. So we have a museum collection, and so any biologist, uh, anyone that wants to, to come and do research on it can, can do that. Um, so we did collect both 42 skull and 21 skull, eight skull, et cetera, and so we have that in our permanent collection. And one thing I can say, which is such an ironic story, of all the wolves in the world, the wolf that was selected to have its DNA sequenced. So we, you know, we know everything ba about wolf DNA based on this one Yellowstone wolf. So if all the wolves in the world were to be wiped out, we could recreate a wolf population from this one particular Yellowstone wolf's DNA. And guess who that wolf was? 
302. <laughs> so in some science fiction movie, <laughs> there'd be a million 302 wolves out there doing 302 wolf things. But he did reform at the end, so maybe it would be the good version of 302, the reform 302. Did someone over? Oh, yes, uh huh, yeah. Um, is there someone following in your footsteps that you picked mm -hmm. up? So the question was, and I don't use the R word, uh, <laughs> uh, they don't pay me anymore, but I still go out every day. So um, yeah, my, my daily life is pretty much like the way it, it was, except I don't have to fill out any government forms anymore. Yeah. Um, so there's a Colorado guy, Jeremy Sundaraj. He grew up in uh, Denver. And I met him when he was nine years old. And his first day in Yellowstone, he saw the, um, I think it was the Sioux Creek pack kill a grizzly bear. No, a black bear, actually. And so he ended up um, being a wildlife biology major at um, University of Montana. As a teenager, he got a job in my little town, Silvergate. He went out with me every day and then go back and work his job. So he graduated, he worked for the state of Montana, and now he's working for the Park Service, pretty much doing what I did. And he's very, very good at working with people. So if you visit us, uh, he'll be the guy in the orange vest. He'll say, yes, this is this pack and that pack. Uh, he'll sign autographs for you. And so he's the perfect guy for the job. So perfect guy. He's a writer. A writer? A writer. Not not yet, but uh, I think soon, yeah, okay. mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, a lady well, over here. An all-time favorite moment. Boy, that's a really good question. Um, let me think about that. Yeah, I guess it would be something that I've already mentioned, those that last evening when I saw 21 and 42, and in just such a, a gentle, romantic way, he just, while they're in the mating tide, just kind of embraced 42 around the shoulder. Yeah, that's the memory, yeah. Thank you for asking that, that's a good question. Okay. Anyone else? Someone over there? Uh -huh. Okay, he was asking the, the books and perhaps the movies if it will help to change uh, the perception of wolves. Yes, and I, <laughs> I, I don't want to claim that it's any, anything because of me, it's because of their stories. I'm just telling their stories. I'm not making up anything. But I've had a number of times where, and for some reason it's always a woman will come up to me and say that they bought extra copies of my book and they gave it to their male friends that were hunters that kind of were against wolves. And they, they told me that every time they did that, it really changed them. And so I believe in the power of stories to change people. Um, unfortunately, we find in research that if, if you try to present a logical, rational argument to someone about why we should be more protective of wolves, rationality doesn't work. Uh, they just double down and they believe what they want to believe harder. So stories change people. Emotional stories change people. And so I've already found that to be happening with my books. And so if there are films, um, boy, I, I think that will really change a lot of people. So I'm naturally an optimistic person. and. Um, we're in very troubled times now regarding wolf management throughout part of the country. There's a lot of bad people that are proposing real bad legislation. But I think we're going to be able to turn this around. And the way to do it, I think, are these stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. family structure and everything. 
So before we part, uh, the other thing is we're going to use drawing for the comic card. So I get to draw here, and I don't have my glasses, so I get to press my eyes. Oh, and he can tell, call out the number.